Andres Bonifacio y de Castro, November 30, 1863 to May 10, 1897, was a Filipino revolutionary leader and the president of the Tagalog Republic. He is often called the father of the Philippine Revolution. He was one of the founders and later supremo, supreme leader, of the Kataz Tasan, Kagalangalanging Katipunan ng Mga Anak ng Bayan or more commonly known as Katipunan, a movement which sought the independence of the Philippines from Spanish colonial rule and started the Philippine Revolution. He is considered a national hero of the Philippines. Education and early life Bonifacio S. Mother, Catalina de Castro, was a blue-collar worker. He learned the alphabet through his mother's sister. He was first enrolled in Guillermo Osmeña's private school, where he learned Latin and mathematics. However, his normal schooling was cut short when he dropped out when he was about 14 years old to support his siblings after both of their parents died of illnesses one year apart. Bonifacio was blessed with good hands in craftsmanship and visual arts that he made canes and paper fans, which he and his young siblings sold. He also made posters for business firms. This became their thriving family business that continued on when the men of the family, namely Andres, Suriaco, Procopio, and Tradio, were employed with private and government companies, which provided them with decent living conditions. In his late teens, he worked as a mandatorio for the British trading firm Fleming & Company, where he rose to become a corregidor of tar, rattan and other goods. He later transferred to Fressel & Company, a German trading firm, where he worked as a bodeguero, storehouse keeper, where he is responsible for warehouse inventory. Not finishing his normal education, Bonifacio enriched his natural intelligence with self-education. He read books about the French Revolution, biographies of the presidents of the United States, books about contemporary Philippine penal and civil codes, and novels such as Victor Hugo. S. Les Miserables, Eugene Sue. S. Le Juif Arendt and Jose Rizal's Noli Mi Tangere and El Filibusterismo. Aside from Tagalog and Spanish, he could speak and understand English, which he learned while working at J.M. Fleming & Co. Marriages Andres Bonifacio was married twice, first to a certain Monica of Palomar. She was Bonifacio's neighbor in Tondo. Monica died of leprosy and they had no recorded children. In 1892 Bonifacio, a 29-year-old widower, met the 18-year-old Gregoria de Jesus, through his friend Teodoro Plata who was her cousin. Gregoria, also called Oriang, was the daughter of a prominent citizen and landowner from Caloocan. Gregoria as parents did not agree at first to their relationship as Andres was a Freemason and Freemasons were then considered enemies of the Catholic Church. Her parents eventually gave in and Andres and Gregoria were married through a Catholic ceremony in Binondo Church in March 1893 or 1894. The couple also were married through Katipunan rites in a friend's house in Sta. Cruz, Manila on the same day of their church wedding. They had one son, born in early 1896, who died of smallpox in infancy. Early political activism In 1892 Bonifacio was one of the founding members of José Rizal's La Liga Filipina, an organization which called for political reforms in Spahn's colonial government of the Philippines. However, La Liga disbanded after only one meeting as Rizal was arrested and deported to Dapitan in Mindanao. Bonifacio, Apolinario Mabina and others revived La Liga in Rizal's absence and Bonifacio was active at organizing local chapters in Manila. He would become the chief propagandist of the revived Liga. La Liga Filipina contributed moral and financial support to the propaganda movement of Filipino reformists in Spain. Andres Bonifacio was also a member of Freemasonry with the Lodge Talaba headed by José Dizon, and his pseudonym was Sinucuan, possibly taken from a Philippine mythological character Maria Sinucuan. Katipunan On the night of July 7, 1892, the day after Rizal 
S deportation was announced, Bonifacio and others officially founded the Katipunan, or in full, Katastasing Kagalangalanging Katipunan ng Mga Anak ng Bayan, highest and most respected society of the country. As children. Bayan can also denote community, people, and nation. The secret society sought independence from Spain through armed revolt. It was influenced by Freemasonry through its rituals and organization, and several members including Bonifacio were also Freemasons. Within the society Bonifacio used the pseudonym Mate Pag Asa. There is hope. Quote closing parenthesis dot. Newly found documents though suggest that Katipunan has already been existing as early as January 1892. For a time, Bonifacio worked with both the Katipunan and La Liga Filipina. La Liga eventually split because some members like Bonifacio lost hope for peaceful reform and stopped their monetary aid. The more conservative members, mostly wealthy members, who still believed in peaceful reforms set up the Cuerpo de Compromisarios, which pledged continued support to the reformists in Spain. The radicals were subsumed into the Katipunan. From Manila, the Katipunan expanded to several provinces, including Batangas, Laguna, Cavite, Bulacan, Pampanga, and Nueva Ecija. Most of its members, called Katipuneros, came from the lower and middle classes, and many of its local leaders were prominent figures in their municipalities. At first exclusively male, membership was later extended to females, with Bonifacio's wife Gregoria de Jesus as a leading member. From the beginning, Bonifacio was one of the chief Katipunan officers, although he did not become its supremo, supreme leader, or presidente supremo, supreme president, until 1895. He was the third head of the Katipunan after Deodato Arellano and Roman Basa. Prior to this, he served as the society's controller and then as its fiscal. The society had its own laws, bureaucratic structure and elective leadership. For each province involved, the Katipunan Supreme Council coordinated with provincial councils in charge of public administration and military affairs, and with local councils in charge of affairs on the district or barrio level. Within the society, Bonifacio developed a strong friendship with Emilio Jacinto, who served as his advisor and confidant, as well as a member of the Supreme Council. Bonifacio adopted Jacinto's Cartilia Primer as the official teachings of the society in place of his own Decalogue, which he judged as inferior. Bonifacio, Jacinto and Pio Valenzuela collaborated on the society's organ, Calayan, Freedom, which had only one printed issue. Bonifacio wrote several pieces for the paper, including the poem Pagibig sa Tinabuang Lupa approximately. Quote, Love for One's Homeland under the pseudonym Agapito Bagambayan. The publication of Calayan in March 1896 led to a great increase in the society's membership. The Katipunan movement spread throughout Luzon, to Panay in the Visayas and even as far as Mindanao. From less than 300 members in January 1896, it had 30,000 to 40,000 by August 1896. The rapid increase in Katipunan activity drew the suspicion of the Spanish authorities. By early 1896, Spanish intelligence was aware of the existence of a seditious secret society, and suspects were kept under surveillance and arrests were made. On 3 May, Bonifacio held a general assembly of Katipunan leaders in Pasig, where they debated when to start the revolution. While some officers, especially Bonifacio, believed a revolution was inevitable, some members, especially Santiago Alvarez and Emilio Aguinaldo both of Cavite, expressed reservations and disagreement regarding the planned revolt due to lack of firearms. The consensus was to consult José Rizal in Dapitan before launching armed action, so Bonifacio sent Pio Valenzuela to Rizal. Rizal turned out to be against the revolution, believing it to be premature. He recommended more preparation, but suggested that, in the event the revolution did break out they should seek the leadership of Antonio Luna, who was widely regarded as a brilliant military leader. Philippine Revolution Start of the uprising The Spanish authorities confirmed the existence of the Katipunan on August 19, 1896. 
Hundreds of Filipino suspects, both innocent and guilty, were arrested and imprisoned for treason. Jose Rizal was then on his way to Cuba to serve as a doctor in the Spanish colonial army in exchange for his release from Dapitan. When the news broke, Bonifacio first tried to convince Rizal, quarantined aboard a ship in Manila Bay, to escape and join the imminent revolt. Bonifacio, Emilio Jacinto and Guillermo Masangay disguised themselves as sailors and went to the pier where Rizal's ship was anchored. Jacinto personally met with Rizal, who rejected their rescue offer. Rizal himself was later arrested, tried and executed, eluding an intensive manhunt. Bonifacio called thousands of Katipunan members to a mass gathering in Caloocan, where they decided to start their uprising. The event, marked by the tearing of settlers, community tax certificates, was later called the Cry of Balintawak, or Cry of Pugad Lawn. The exact location and date of the cry are disputed. The Supreme Council of the Katipunan declared a nationwide armed revolution against Spain and called for a simultaneous coordinated attack on the capital Manila on August 29. Bonifacio appointed generals to lead rebel forces to Manila. Other Katipunan councils were also informed of their plans. Before hostilities erupted, Bonifacio reorganized the Katipunan into an open de facto revolutionary government and they named the nation and its government Herring Bay and Katagalugan, loosely translates to Tagalog Republic, with him as President and Commander-in-Chief, or Generalissimo, of the rebel army and the Supreme Council as his cabinet. On August 28, Bonifacio issued the following general proclamation. This manifesto is for all of you. It is absolutely necessary for us to stop at the earliest possible time the nameless oppositions being perpetrated on the sons of the country who are now suffering the brutal punishment and tortures in jails, and because of this please let all the brethren know that on Saturday, the 29th of the current month, the revolution shall commence according to our agreement. For this purpose, it is necessary for all towns to rise simultaneously and attack Manila at the same time. Anybody who obstructs this sacred ideal of the people will be considered a traitor and an enemy, except if he is ill, or is not physically fit, in which case he shall be tried according to the regulations we have put in force. Is Mount of Liberty, 28 August 1896 Andres Bonifacio On August 30, 1896, Bonifacio personally led an attack on San Juan del Monte to capture the town s powder magazine and water station, which supplied Manila. The defending Spaniards, outnumbered, fought a delaying battle until reinforcements arrived. Once reinforced, the Spaniards drove Bonifacio's forces back with heavy casualties. Bonifacio and his troops regrouped near Marikina, San Mateo and Montalban. Elsewhere, fighting between rebels and Spanish forces occurred in Mandaluyong, Sampaloc, Santa Ana, Pandacan, Pateros, Marikina, Caloocan, Makati and Taguig. The conventional view among Filipino historians is that the planned General Katipunan offensive on Manila was aborted in favor of Bonifacio's attack on San Juan del Monte, which sparked a general state of rebellion in the area. However, more recent studies have advanced the view that the planned offensive did push through and the rebel attacks were integrated. According to this view, Bonifacio's San Juan del Monte battle was only a part of a bigger whole, an unrecognized battle for Manila. Despite his reverses, Bonifacio was not completely defeated and was still considered a threat. Further, the revolt had spread to the surrounding provinces by the end of August. Campaigns around Manila By December 1896, the Spanish government recognized three major centers of rebellion, Cavite, under Mariano Alvarez, Emilio Aguinaldo and others, Bulacan, under Mariano Yanera, and Morong, under Bonifacio. The revolt was most successful in Cavite, which mostly fell under rebel control by September to October 1896, while Manila is traditionally regarded as the Heartland of the Philippine Revolution. Cavite and its surrounding municipalities bore the brunt of the Spanish military campaign, becoming a no-man's land. Rebels in the area were generally engaged in hit-and-run guerrilla warfare against Spanish positions in Manila, Morong, Nueva Ecija and Pampanga. 
From Morong, Bonifacio served as tactician for rebel guerrillas and issued commands to areas other than his personal sector, though his reputation suffered when he lost battles he personally led. From September to October 1896, Bonifacio supervised the establishment of Katipunan Mountain and hill bases like Balara in Marikina, Pantayanan in Antipolo, Yugong in Pasig, and Tunco in Bulacan. Bonifacio appointing generals for these areas, or approving selections the troops themselves made. On November 7, 1896, Bonifacio led an assault on San Mateo, Marikina, and Montalban. The Spanish were forced to retreat, leaving these areas to the rebels, except for the municipal hall of San Mateo where some Spanish troops had barricaded. While Bonifacio S. Troops laid siege to the hall. Other Katipunan forces set up defensive lines along the nearby Lanka or Nanka, River against Spanish reinforcements coming from the direction of Marikina. After three days, Spanish counterattacks broke through the Nanka River lines. The Spanish troops thus recaptured the rebel positions and surprised Bonifacio in San Mateo, who ordered a general retreat to Balara. They were pursued, and Bonifacio was nearly killed shielding Emilio Jacinto from a Spanish bullet which grazed his collar. In Ballara, Bonifacio commissioned Julio Nakpil to compose a national anthem. Nakpil produced a hymn called Marangal na Dalit ng Katagalugan, Honorable Hymn of the Tagalogs, and became the official national anthem during the entire period of the revolution until it was replaced years later by another national anthem commissioned by the new Republica Filipina government that replaced the Herring Bay and Katagalugan. Bonifacio in Cavite After Bonifacio S. Disastrous defeat in Manila, Bonifacio sought refuge in Cavite where the revolutionaries were victorious. There were two Katipunan provincial chapters in Cavite that became rival factions, the Magdalo, headed by Emilio Aguinaldo's cousin Baldomero Aguinaldo, and the Magduing, headed by Mariano Alvarez, uncle of Bonifacio's wife. Leaders of both factions came from the upper class, in contrast to Bonifacio, who came from the lower middle class. After initial successes, Emilio Aguinaldo issued a manifesto in the name of the Magdalo ruling council which proclaimed a provisional and revolutionary government, despite the existence of the Katipunan government. Emilio Aguinaldo in particular had won fame for victories in the province. The Magdalo and Magduing clashed over authority and jurisdiction and did not help each other in battle. Bonifacio, as the recognized overall leader of the revolution, was invited by the Cavite leaders to mediate between them and unify their efforts. After multiple letters were sent to Bonifacio urging him to come, in December 1896 he traveled to Cavite accompanied by his wife, his brothers Procopio and Suriaco, and some troops, including Emilio Jacinto, Bonifacio's secretary and right-hand man. Jacinto was said to be against Bonifacio. S. Expedition to Cavite In Cavite, friction grew between Bonifacio and the Magdalo leaders. Apolinario Mabina, who later served as Emilio Aguinaldo's advisor, writes that at this point the Magdalo leaders already paid little heed to his authority and orders. Bonifacio was partial to the Magdoing, perhaps due to his kinship ties with Mariano Alvarez, or more importantly, due to their stronger recognition of his authority. When Aguinaldo and Edilberto Evangelista went to receive Bonifacio at Zapote, they were irritated with what they regarded as his attitude of superiority. In his memoirs Aguinaldo wrote that Bonifacio acted as if he were a king. Another time, Bonifacio ordered the arrest of one Katipunan general from Laguna surnamed Fernandez, who was accompanying the Magdalo leaders in paying their respect to Bonifacio, for failing to support his attack in Manila, but the other Magdalo leaders refused to surrender him. Townspeople in Navaleta, a Magdoing town, acclaimed Bonifacio as the ruler of the Philippines. To the chagrin of the Magdalo leaders, Bonifacio replied, Long live Philippine liberty! Aguinaldo disputed with Bonifacio over strategic troop placements and blamed him for the capture of the town of Salang. The Spanish, through Jesuit superior Pio Pai, wrote to Aguinaldo about the possibility of peace negotiations. When Bonifacio found out, he and the Magdoing Council rejected the proposed peace talks. Bonifacio was also angered that the Spanish considered Aguinaldo the chief of the rebellion, 
instead of him. However, Aguinaldo continued to arrange negotiations which never took place. Bonifacio believed Aguinaldo was willing to surrender the revolution. Bonifacio was also subject to rumors that he had stolen Katipunan funds, his sister was the mistress of a priest, and he was an agent provocateur paid by friars to foment unrest. Also circulated were anonymous letters which told the people of Cavite not to idolize Bonifacio because he was a mason, a mere Manila employee, allegedly an atheist, and an educated. According to these letters, Bonifacio did not deserve the title of Supremo since only God was supreme. This last allegation was made despite the fact that Supremo was meant to be used in conjunction with Presidente, i.e. Presidente Supremo, Supreme President, to distinguish the President of the Katipunan Supreme Council from Council Presidents of subordinate Katipunan chapters like the Magdalo and Magdawing. Bonifacio suspected the rumor-mongering to be the work of the Magdalo leader Daniel Torona. He confronted Torona, whose airy reply provoked Bonifacio to such anger that he drew a gun and would have shot Torona if others had not intervened. On December 31, Bonifacio and the Magdalo and Magdawing leaders held a meeting in Imus, ostensibly to determine the leadership of Cavite in order to end the rivalry between the two factions. The issue of whether the Katipunan should be replaced by a revolutionary government was brought up by the Magdalo, and this eclipsed the rivalry issue. The Magdalo argued that the Katipunan, as a secret society, should have ceased to exist once the revolution was underway. They also held that Cavite should not be divided. Bonifacio and the Magdawing contended that the Katipunan served as their revolutionary government since it had its own constitution, laws, and provincial and municipal governments. Edilberto Evangelista presented a draft constitution for the proposed government to Bonifacio but he rejected it as it was too similar to the Spanish moral law. Upon the event of restructuring, Bonifacio was given carte blanche to appoint a committee tasked with setting up a new government, he would also be in charge of this committee. He tasked Emilio Aguinaldo to record the minutes of the meeting and requested for it to establish this authority, but these were never done and never provided. Herring Bayang Katagalugan Influenced by Freemasonry, the Katipunan had been organized with its own laws, bureaucratic structure and elective leadership. For each province it involved, the Supreme Council coordinated provincial councils which were in charge of public administration and military affairs on the supra-municipal or quasi-provincial level, and local councils, in charge of affairs on the district or barrio level. In the last days of August, the Katipunan members met in Caloocan and decided to start their revolt. The event was later called the Cry of Balintawak or Cry of Pugad Lawn. The exact location and date are disputed. A day after the cry, the Supreme Council of the Katipunan held elections, with the following results. The above was divulged to the Spanish by the Katipunan member Pio Valenzuela while in captivity. Teodoro Agoncillo thus wrote, Milagros C. Guerrero and others have described Bonifacio as effectively the commander-in-chief of the revolutionaries. They assert one name for Bonifacio's concept of the Philippine nation-state appears in surviving Katipunan documents, Herring Bayang Katagalugan, Sovereign Nation of Katagalugan, or Sovereign Tagalog Nation, sometimes shortened into Herring Bayan, Sovereign Nation. Bayan may be rendered as nation, or people. Bonifacio is named as the president of the Tagalog Republic, in an issue of the Spanish periodical La Ilustración Española y Americana, published in February 1897, Andrés Bonifacio, titulado Presidente, de la República Tagala. Another name for Bonifacio's government was República Inca Tagalugan, another form of Tagalog Republic. As evidenced by a picture of a rebel seal published in the same periodical the next month, official letters and one appointment paper of Bonifacio addressed to Emilio Jacinto reveal Bonifacio's various titles and designations, as follows President of the Supreme Council Supreme President President of the Sovereign Nation of Katagalugan, Sovereign Tagalog Nation President of the Sovereign Nation, Founder of the Katipunan, Initiator of the Revolution 
Office of the Supreme President, Government of the Revolution In 1897 power struggle in Cavite led to command of the revolution shifting to Emilio Aguinaldo at the Tejeros Convention, where a new government was formed. Bonifacio was executed after he refused to recognize the new government. The Aguinaldo-headed Philippine Republic, Spanish, Republica Filipina, usually considered the first Philippine Republic, was formally established in 1899, after a succession of revolutionary and dictatorial governments, e.g. the Tejeros government, the Biak na Bato Republic, also headed by Aguinaldo. The Tejeros Convention Bonifacio even though fully aware of the Spanish assault in Pérez de Mariñas, offered no help to the Magdalo faction. On March 22, 1897, the revolutionary leaders held an important meeting in a friar estate residence at Tejeros to resume their discussions regarding the escalating tension between the Magdalo and Magduing forces, and also to settle once and for all the issue of governance within the Katipunan through an election. Amidst implications on whether the government of the Katipunan should be established as a monarchy or as a republic, Bonifacio defended that it should be maintained as a republic. According to him, all of its members of any given rank shall serve under the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity, upon which republicanism was founded. Despite Bonifacio's concern on the lack of officials and representatives from other provinces, he was obliged to proceed with the election. Before the election started, he asked that the results be respected by everyone, and all agreed. The Magdalo faction voted their own Emilio Aguinaldo president in absentia, as he was involved in the Battle of Pérez de Mariñas, which was then ongoing. That revolutionary government, now known as the Republic of Biak na Bato, styled itself as the Philippine Republic or Republic of the Philippines. It lasted just over a month. A later revolutionary government now commonly known as the First Philippine Republic and also with Aguinaldo as president was inaugurated on January 23, 1899 as the Republica Filipina Philippine Republic. That later government is now considered to be the First Republic of the Philippines, the present-day government of the Philippines being the fifth. Bonifacio received the second highest number of votes for president. Though it was suggested that he be automatically be awarded the vice presidency, no one seconded the motion and the election continued. Mariano Trias of the Magdawing was elected vice president. Bonifacio was the last to be elected, as director of the interior. Daniel Tarona protested Bonifacio being appointed as director of the interior on the grounds that the position should not be occupied by a person without a lawyer. S. Diploma. Torona suggested a prominent lawyer for the position such as José del Rosario. Insulted and angered, Bonifacio demanded an apology, since the voters had agreed to respect the election results. Torona ignored Bonifacio's demand for apology which drove Bonifacio to draw his gun and again nearly shot Torona, who hid among the people, but he was restrained by Artemio Ricarte of the Magdawing, who had been elected Captain General. As people left the room, Bonifacio declared, I, as chairman of this assembly and as president of the Supreme Council of the Katipunan, as all of you do not deny, declare this assembly dissolved, and I annul all that has been approved and resolved. The next day, Aguinaldo surreptitiously took his oath of office as president in a chapel officiated by a Catholic priest Senan Villafranca who was under the authority of the Roman Pope. According to Gen. Santiago Alvarez, guards were posted outside with strict instructions not to let in any unwanted partisan from the Magdawing faction while the oath-taking took place. Artemio Ricarte also took his office with great reluctance and made a declaration that he found the Tejeros elections dirty or shady and not been in conformity with the true will of the people. Meanwhile, Bonifacio met with his remaining supporters and drew up the Acta de Tejeros, Act of Tejeros, wherein they gave their reasons for not accepting the election results. Bonifacio alleged the election was fraudulent due to cheating and accused Aguinaldo of treason due to his negotiations with the Spanish. In their memoirs Santiago Alvarez, son of Mariano, and Gregoria de Jesus both alleged that many ballots were already filled out before being distributed, and Guillermo Masangue contended there were more ballots prepared than voters present. Alvarez writes that Bonifacio had been warned by a Cavite leader Diego Mojica of the rigged ballots before the votes were canvassed, but he had done nothing. After Tejero's Convention 
On March 23, 1897, the day after the Tejeros Convention, Bonifacio with his men and his remaining supporters in the province, mostly of the Magduing faction, met again in the Tejeros Estate House and drafted a document called Acta de Tejeros which called for the rejection of the election that happened the day before. This document was signed by Bonifacio himself and 44 others, including Artemio Ricarte, Mariano Alvarez and Pascual Alvarez. Then again, in a later meeting on April 19 in NAIC, another document, the NAIC Military Agreement, was drawn up which declared that its 41 signatories. Having discovered the treason committed by certain officers who have been sowing discord and conniving with the Spaniards, and other offensive acts, had agreed to deliver the people from this grave danger by raising an army corps, by persuasion or force, under the command of General Pio del Pilar. This document had 41 signatories including Bonifacio, Ricarte and del Pilar. The meeting was interrupted by Aguinaldo himself, and Del Pilar, Mariano Noriel and others present, promptly returned to Aguinaldo's fold. Aguinaldo attempted to persuade Bonifacio to cooperate with his government, but Bonifacio refused and proceeded to Indong, Cavite planning to get out of Cavite and proceed back to Morong. In late April, Aguinaldo fully assumed presidential office after consolidating his position among the Cavite elite, most of Bonifacio's Magduing supporters shifting allegiance to Aguinaldo. Aguinaldo's government then ordered the arrest of Bonifacio, who was then moving out of Cavite. Trial and death In April 1897, Aguinaldo ordered the arrest of Bonifacio after he received a letter alleging that Bonifacio had burned down a village and ordered the burning of the Church of Indong after townspeople refused to give him provisions. Many of the principal men of Indong, among them Severino de las Alas, presented to Emilio Aguinaldo several complaints against Bonifacio that the Supremo's men stole carabaos and other work animals by force and killed them for food. On April 25, a party of Aguinaldo's men led by Col. Agapito Bonzin and Major José Ignacio, Insic Paua caught up with Bonifacio at his camp in Barrio Limbon, Indong. The unsuspecting Bonifacio received them cordially. Early the next day, Bonzin and Paua attacked Bonifacio's camp. Bonifacio was surprised and refused to fight against fellow Tagalogs, ordering his men to hold their fire, but shots were nevertheless exchanged. Bonifacio was shot in the arm by Bonzin and Paua stabbed him in the neck but was prevented from striking further by one of Bonifacio's men, who offered to be killed instead. Andres S. brother Suriaco was shot dead, while his other brother Procopio was beaten, and his wife Gregoria could have been raped by Bonzin. From Indong, a half-starved and wounded Bonifacio was carried by hammock to NAIC, which had become President Aguinaldo's headquarters, Bonifacio. S. party was brought to NAIC, where he and Procopio stood trial on charges of sedition and treason against Aguinaldo government and conspiracy to murder Aguinaldo. The jury was composed entirely of Aguinaldo's men and even Bonifacio's defense lawyer himself declared his client's guilt. Bonifacio was barred from confronting the state witness for the charge of conspiracy to murder on the grounds that the latter had been killed in battle, but after the trial the witness was seen alive with the prosecutors, the Bonifacio brothers were found guilty despite insufficient evidence and recommended to be executed. Aguinaldo commuted the sentence to deportation on May 8, 1897 but Pio del Pilar and Mariano Noriel persuaded him to withdraw the order for the sake of preserving unity. In this they were seconded by Mamerto Natividad and other bona fide supporters of Aguinaldo. The Bonifacio brothers were executed on May 10, 1897 in the mountains of Maragondon. Apolinario Mabina wrote that Bonifacio S. death demoralized many rebels from Manila, Laguna and Batangas who had come to help those in Cavite, and caused them to quit. In other areas, Bonifacio's close associates like Emilio Jacinto and Macario Sake continued the Katipunan and never recognized Aguinaldo's authority. 
Historical controversies The historical assessment of Bonifacio involves several controversial points. His death is alternately viewed as a justified execution for treason and a legal murder fueled by politics. Some historians consider him to be the rightful first president of the Philippines instead of Aguinaldo. Some historians have also called that Bonifacio share or even take the place of Jose Rizal as the foremost Philippine national hero. The purported discovery of Bonifacio's remains has also been questioned. Trial and execution Historians have condemned the trial of the Bonifacio brothers as unjust. The jury was entirely composed of Aguinaldo's men, Bonifacio. S. defense lawyer acted more like a prosecutor as he himself declared Bonifacio's guilt and instead appealed for less punishment, and Bonifacio was not allowed to confront the state witness for the charge of conspiracy on the grounds that the latter had been killed in battle, but later the witness was seen with the prosecutors. Teodoro Agoncillo writes that Bonifacio S. declaration of authority in opposition to Aguinaldo posed a danger to the revolution, because a split in the rebel forces would result in almost certain defeat to their united and well-armed Spanish foe. In contrast, Renato Constantino contends that Bonifacio was neither a danger to the revolution in general for he still planned to fight the Spanish, nor to the revolution in Cavite since he was leaving, but Bonifacio was definitely a threat to the Cavite leaders who wanted control of the revolution, so he was eliminated. Constantino contrasts Bonifacio who had no record of compromise with the Spanish with the Cavite leaders who did compromise, resulting in the Pact of Biak na Bato whereas the revolution was officially halted and its leaders exiled, though many Filipinos continued to fight especially Katipunan leaders used to be close to Bonifacio, Aguinaldo eventually, unofficially allied with the United States, did return to take charge of the revolution during the Spanish-American War. Historians have also discussed the motives of the Cavite government to replace Bonifacio, and whether it had the right to do so. The Magdalo Provincial Council which helped establish a republican government led by one of their own was only one of many such councils in the pre-existing Katipunan government. Therefore, Constantino and Alejo Villanueva write Aguinaldo and his faction may be considered counter-revolutionary as well, as guilty of violating Bonifacio s constituted authority just as they considered Bonifacio to violate theirs. Aguinaldo's own advisor and official Apolinario Mabina writes that he was "...primarily answerable for insubordination against the head of the Katipunan of which he was a member." Aguinaldo's authority was not immediately recognized by all rebels. If Bonifacio had escaped Cavite, he would have had the right as the Katipunan leader to prosecute Aguinaldo for treason instead of the other way around. Constantino and Villanueva also interpret the Tejeros Convention as the culmination of a movement by members of the upper class represented by Aguinaldo to wrest power from Bonifacio who represented the middle and lower classes. Regionalism among the Cavite rebels, dubbed Cavitismo by Constantino, has also been put forward as motivation for the replacement of Bonifacio. Mabina considered the execution as criminal and assassination. The first victory of personal ambition over true patriotism. He also noted that all the electors at the Tejeros Convention were friends of Don Emilio Aguinaldo and Don Mariano Trias, who were united, while Bonifacio, although he had established his integrity, was looked upon with distrust only because he was not a native of the province. This explains his resentment. There are differing accounts of Bonifacio manner of execution. The commanding officer of the execution party, Lazaro Macapagal, said in two separate accounts that the Bonifacio brothers were shot to death, which is the orthodox interpretation. Macapagal's second account has Bonifacio attempting to escape after his brother is shot, but he is also killed while running away. Macapagal writes that they buried the brothers in shallow graves dug with bayonets and marked by twigs. However, another account states that after his brother was shot, Bonifacio was stabbed and hacked to death. This was allegedly done while he lay prone in a hammock in which he was carried to the site, being too weak to walk. This version was maintained by Guillermo Masangay, who claimed to have gotten this information from one of Macapagal. 
S. Men. Also, one account used to corroborate this version is of an alleged eyewitness, a farmer who claimed he saw five men hacking a man in a hammock. Historian Milagros Guerrero also says Bonifacio was bayoneted, and that the brothers were left unburied. After bones said to be Bonifacio's, including a fractured skull, were discovered in 1918, Masangay claimed the forensic evidence supported his version of events. Writer Adrian Cristobal notes that accounts of Bonifacio S. Captivity and trial state he was very weak due to his wounds being left untreated. He thus doubts that Bonifacio was strong enough to make a last dash for freedom as Macapagal claimed. Historian Ambeth Ocampo, who doubts the Bonifacio bones were authentic, thus also doubts the possibility of Bonifacio's death by this manner. Bonifacio is first Philippine president. Some historians such as Milagros Guerrero, Emmanuel Encarnacion, Ramon Villegas and Michael Charleston Chua have pushed for the recognition of Bonifacio as the first president of the Philippines instead of Aguinaldo, the officially recognized one. This view is based on his position of President Supremo of the Katipunan Revolutionary Government from 1896 to 97. This view also emphasizes that Bonifacio established a government through the Katipunan before a government headed by Aguinaldo was formed at the Tejeros Convention. Guerrero writes that Bonifacio had a concept of the Philippine nation called Herring Bay and Katagalugan, sovereign Tagalog nation, which was displaced by Aguinaldo. S. Concept of Filipinas. In documents predating Tejeros and the First Philippine Republic, Bonifacio is called the President of the Tagalog Republic. The term Tagalog historically refers to an ethnic group, their language, and script. While historians have thus tended to view Bonifacio's concept of the Philippine nation as restricted to the Tagalog regions of Luzon, as compared to Aguinaldo. S view of Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao comprising the modern Philippines, Guerrero writes that Bonifacio and the Katipunan in fact already had an all-encompassing view. The Cartilia defines Tagalog as all those born in this archipelago, therefore, though Visayan, Ilocano, Pampango, etc., they are all Tagalogs. In their memoirs, Emilio Aguinaldo and other Magdalo people claim Bonifacio became the head of the Magdawing, receiving the title Hari ng Bayan King of the People, with Mariano Alvarez as his second in command. However, these claims are unsupported by documentary evidence. Carlos Quirino suggests these claims stem from a misunderstanding or misrepresentation of Bonifacio's title Pangulo ng Herring Bayan, President of the Sovereign Nation. Santiago Alvarez, son of Mariano, distinguishes between the Magdawing government and the Katipunan Supreme Council headed by Bonifacio. Bonifacio is national hero. Jose Rizal is generally considered the national hero, but Bonifacio has been suggested as a more worthy candidate on the grounds of having started the Philippine Revolution. Teodoro Agoncillo notes that the Philippine national hero, unlike those of other countries, is not the leader of its liberation forces. Renato Constantino writes that Rizal is a United States-sponsored hero who was promoted as the greatest Filipino hero during the American colonial period of the Philippines, after Aguinaldo lost the Philippine-American War. The United States promoted Rizal, who was taken to represent peaceful political advocacy, instead of more radical figures whose ideas could inspire resistance against American rule. Specifically, Rizal was selected over Bonifacio who was viewed as too radical, and Apolinario Mabina who was unregenerate. Historian Ambeth Ocampo gives the opinion that arguing for Bonifacio is the better hero on the grounds that he, not Rizal, began the Philippine Revolution, is moot since Rizal inspired Bonifacio, the Katipunan, and the Revolution. Even prior to Rizal's banishment to Dapitan, he was already regarded by the Filipino people as a national hero, having been elected as honorary president by the Katipunan. Leon Maria Guerrero notes that while Rizal did not give his blessing to the Katipunan because he believed the time was premature, he did not condemn the aim of independence per se. Teodoro Agoncillo gives the opinion that Bonifacio should not replace Rizal as national hero, but they should be honored. Side by side. Despite popular recognition of Rizal as 
the Philippine national hero. The title itself has no explicit legal definition in present Philippine law. Rizal and Bonifacio, however, are given the implied recognition of being national heroes because they are commemorated annually nationwide, Rizal Day on December 30 and Bonifacio Day on November 30. According to the website of the National Center for Culture and the Arts, Despite the lack of any official declaration explicitly proclaiming them as national heroes, Rizal and Bonifacio, remain admired and revered for their roles in Philippine history. Heroes, according to historians, should not be legislated. Their appreciation should be better left to academics. Acclamation for heroes, they felt, would be recognition enough. Bonifacio's Bones in 1918, the American colonial government of the Philippines mounted a search for Bonifacio's remains in Marigondon. A group consisting of government officials, former rebels, and a man reputed to be Bonifacio's servant found bones which they claimed were Bonifacio's in a sugarcane field on March 17. The bones were placed in an urn and put into the care of the National Library of the Philippines. They were housed at the library. S. Headquarters in the Legislative Building in Ermita, Manila, together with some of Bonifacio's papers and personal belongings. The authenticity of the bones was much disputed at the time and has been challenged as late as 2001 by Ambeth Ocampo. When Emilio Aguinaldo ran for President of the Commonwealth of the Philippines in 1935, his opponent Manuel L. Quezon, the eventual victor, invoked the memory of Bonifacio against him, the bones being the result of Bonifacio's execution by the revolutionary government headed by Aguinaldo. During World War II, the Philippines was invaded by Japan in December 1941. The bones were lost due to the widespread destruction and looting during the Allied capture of Manila in February 1945. Portrayal in the media Portrayed by Julio Diaz in the film Bayani 1995, and the unrelated TV series Bayani 1995. Portrayed by Gardo Versoza in the film José Rizal 1998. Portrayed by Alfred Vargas in the film Ang Paglilitis K. Andres Bonifacio 2010, and in the film, Supremo 2012. Portrayed by Mark Anthony Fernandez in GMA Looping Hinarang Music Video in 2010. Portrayed by Cesar Montano in the film El Presidente 2012. Portrayed by Jolo Rivia in the TV series Indio 2012. Portrayed by Sid Lucero in the TV series Katipunan 2013, and Illustrato 2014. Portrayed by Robin Padilla in the film Bonifacio, Ang Unang Pongulo 2014. Portrayed by Nico Antonio in the film General Luna 2015. See also Bonifacio Day Procopio Bonifacio Gregoria de Jesus Emilio Jacinto Catalina de Castro Julio Nicpil Notes References External links Works by or about Andres Bonifacio at Internet Archive Works by Andres Bonifacio at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Andres Bonifacio, 1863-1897. United States Library of Congress The records of the Court Martial of Andres and Procopio Bonifacio Full text and online collection of court documents in Spanish and Old Tagalog with regards to the Andres and Procopio Bonifacio trial. The Court Martial of Andres Bonifacio English translation of the historical court documents and testimonies in the trial and execution of Andres and Procopio Bonifacio processed by Filipiniana.net
Ang de Pat Mabadid ng Mga Tagalog Summary and Full Text of an Article Written by Andres Bonifacio in the Katipunan Newspaper Kalayan Posted in Filipiniana. Net.